Today I'm going to talk about the sad story of freedom of information in Hungary. I think there will be funny parts too, but it has some sadness to it, you will see. Uh, I'm here because I really think that the Freedom of Information Act is a, is a basic democratic right and it's really important to talk to people about how to use it and uh, teach them how to use it. And the uh, technology that uh, NUC has started in Norway is a very good way to introduce it to people. So, just a list of keywords or topics, what I can talk about and what you can ask me about. So I can talk about NGOs in Hungary, non-governmental organizations, civil society. I can also talk about journalism because we are talking now about a website which is started as an investigative journalism site and slash NGO, so Atlatso is an NGO too. And I can also talk about how uh, we communicate with government bodies, so meaning that from the side of the NGOs or from, from the side of the journalists. Also, since I've been involved with uh, projects that are so-called ICT for democracy projects, so IT projects that help people to use their democratic rights or teach them about democracy, um, I can talk about that, how that goes in Hungary. I can also talk somewhat about open data and also about community building, which is a very important thing if you start a website which is for the community. So if you have questions about these things, please let me know. So I thought it would be nice to start with how I joined Atlatso. Uh, I joined them because uh, I wrote uh, an, a blog post for Global Voices Online, which is an international blogging community. Uh, the initiative was started by a Hungarian investigative journalist called Tomás Bodoki, and he left a very famous Hungarian news site uh, earlier, and I wrote about his story. A paragraph of his article was, was edited out in a big newspaper, news site, so uh, it was a big news and scandalous thing among journalists. So he left the news site and he started his own initiative, which was Atlas. So he wanted to start something which is uh, providing a platform for investigative journalism in Hungary. And he was joined by a group of lawyers, uh, hackers, and other journalists as well. Um, maybe it's an interesting fact for you that Atlatso has started uh, in the Budapest hacker space, so our very first meetings were, were there. Mm. And uh, after I published this article, we got in touch with Tamás, and then he asked me if I would join the team. That's how I, how I joined them. And I also got interested in learning more about ICT for Democracy tools, because I was writing for Global Voices, and I saw all these very interesting projects, like Tor, for example, that they, were, they kept posting about. So some facts about Atlatso. We have just had our uh, fourth birthday party. It's an NGO, so it's like officially registered as an NGO. Uh, started in 2011, and uh, we do many things that are considered to be like brave and ambitious, even abroad. So I just listed the, the international awards we got this year. I think it's like pretty cool. Uh, especially the Digital Activism Award, which is uh, something that's uh, related to the today's topic because we, we promote digital activism in the sense that we teach people to use the digi digital tools to take the state, uh, keep the state into account. And um, yeah, the Theodor Heuss Award is a German award and the European Citizens Prize, Prize is an EU prize. So you can kind of see that Atlatso's work has gone beyond Hungary's borders. So uh, originally we imagined a, a, a project where the journalists would be working with the, uh, digital tools to obtain information for their stories. So not only with the freedom of information requests, but for example, leaks. So one of our first sort of services was to start uh, Magyar Leaks. And now Magyar Leaks is running uh, on the Global Leaks software, which is a Tor browser-based uh, 
anonymous leaking platform. And we use this because in many cases, uh, whistleblowers want to leak the information uh, anonymously. Uh, an interesting way to use uh, this whistleblowing platform is that actually the journalist knows the source personally, but they don't want to hand the documents over in person or in any way that's uh, connected to the source. Uh, it's a very important thing for an investigative journalism site to use this kind of tool. We also have another site called uh, Fizetten, which means I paid, but it's running the I paid, I paid the bribe software. So we, co we are collecting stories of uh, bribes and kickbacks in Hungary. Uh, these are all anonymous. We try to use uh, automa automatized, uh, automated anon anonymity solutions for kind of like using machines to remove the names, but that didn't work out with Hungarian that well. So we kind of do it manually. And uh, it's only about uh, how much Hungarian people spend on bribes. So these stories are mainly about doctors, nurses, policemen, uh, public sector workers who are responsible for, uh, for example, issuing permissions for construction work. Um, so we are running this site to just to make people more uh, aware of these everyday corruption stories. We have recently launched a site uh, called Evox, which is eVote in English. Uh, it's running on the Democracy OS software, which is, I'm sure you know about, is from Argentina. It was started by the Partido del Red, uh, the Net Party. It's an open source software where you can start, uh, you, you put questions there and the people can argue and vote about uh, policy issues or social questions. Uh, we have recently started this, so there was only one question that has been closed. Uh, that was about uh, if we should restrict uh, drivers who are 75 years old and uh, over from uh, driving. Uh, we are not trying to put very controversial questions here because it's just the introductory phase. So, for example, this question is about if we should have uh, an anti-corruption agency like Romania has in, in Hungary. But uh, the most recent question is about uh, um, if we should introduce the institution of siesta in Hungary because I'm sure you know in Hungary it's much, much hotter now than here in Norway. So people are thinking about maybe like introducing siesta and then not working for the afternoon or something. So, yeah. And this is my favorite one, Kimitud, which stands for who knows what. Uh, this is the Alavateli software that you are also using. Um, we started this in 2012. This was the original look of the site. So it looks a bit different now. Um, yeah, it's from a year ago, so this screenshot was taken a year ago when we were just surpassing 3,000 requests. Um, you, I'm sure you know how the site works. It's, it works like you go on the site, you search for the data custodian, which is the name for the public body that have, holds the information. And uh, you search for the institution and you start writing an email to them and you submit the email and then it's sent to the, to the institution's email address and it's published uh, online. So all the text is published, all the attachments are published, everything is in public. So later if someone comes to the site, they can look for the information that was already requested. Um, so this is how the site looks now. Um, we have more than 5,000 requests at the moment. Um, it was originally started as a tool for our journalists. So because Hungary has a Freedom of Information Act since the mid-2000s, uh, we have a quite good law, which means we have all the regulations in place that you need for a good Freedom of Information Act. It has been changing in the past years uh, because of the government restrictions. On our website, we have about 50% uh, rate of uh, fulfilled or partially fulfilled uh, freedom of information requests. Uh, 
And Atlas also has a lawyer team, so we have uh, one lawyer who works uh, with us all the time, and then we have pro bono lawyers as well. So they are helping even the users if they have questions, then they can send it to us, and then our lawyers will try to help with how to request the information or where to request the information, for example. Uh, but if there is a case where the institution is withholding the information or they refuse to answer the request, then in important cases we ourselves file lawsuits. And uh, I was told that in many cases it's enough just to start the legal procedure because then the data custodian sees that you are serious and you really want to get the data. And if, if they know that they would lose, of course that costs them money, so they, are, they will just release the document. Uh, we, in general, have at least 10 lawsuits going on at Atlatso. And uh, 60 in 60% 60 of the cases we've, we've been, and then we get the documents too. And we always release them to public, so they are always published for everyone to check and read. So uh, my society, the um, NGO which uh, created the Alavetelli, they have uh, run a big research last year about freedom of information sites, and they have also collected the main requirements for a good freedom of information law. And I think you can use Alavetelli if you have a law which works somewhat like this. So in Hungary, you, uh, the institution has 15 days to reply to your request, and they can extend it to up to an extra 30 days. Uh, in Hungary, unlike I think in Chile, you can send uh, email requests. So in some countries, you are not allowed to send electronic requests, and in Hungary, it's, it's okay to do that. So again, we can use the software. And something that's not related to the software, but it's still good to have in your law is a legal re remedy, which means that you can request some sort of review or uh, investigation from either by filing a lawsuit or going to the Freedom of Information Commissioner, and they would check if the refusal of the request was uh, correct or not. So uh, why is it good to use Alavetelli? Uh, because it really lowers the barriers of uh, using freedom of information requests. You just go on the website, search for the institution, and then write an email, that's it. Basically, we even added an extra uh, reference to the Hungarian Freedom of Information Act. So in, it's in the template that we are sending to them. So basically, someone who gets uh, the email for the request, and they would be able to identify according to which law they should be dealing with the request that you are sending them. Uh, I think it's a very good way to educate cit citizens about how you are being a, a citizen in a democratic country. So for instance, we had an interesting request which was refused because of uh, personal information, so it was an obvious exception. There are exceptions that under which they can refuse your request, for example, national security or personal data has to be removed. Uh, but someone has uh, filed a request on Kimitud on our Olavetali site uh, about how much the prime minister's daughter spent on an announcement with the national news wire because uh, the PM's family went on some holiday and the photos were leaked on social media and then she kind of made an announcement about it that it was not her or I don't know she cannot she didn't have anything to do with the whole case uh, and in Hungary if you want to publish something in the national news wire you can pay and then it's published there so journalists can uh, also use the information and it's a way to communicate with people for the government for example so she published this statement and then a user uh, in Hungary requested the contract for how much she, she spent on this and then they refused it. But this is, I think, one of our most popular requests. Just uh, checked it today and it has 5,970 something Facebook likes, which is 
you know, a lot for a freedom of information request. Like, it's, it's, it's very unusual. So, uh, and it was shared by many people, so it's a good way to promote the law. How, it would have been nicer if they have requested something that publishes the information, but still I think it's a good example. Uh, the freedom of information law is very good for advocacy for NGOs because they can obtain important documents, uh, they can figure out important policy numbers and facts that they can use in their advocacy work. Business can also use the freedom of information request. I have even used it to uh, just take a look around uh, because uh, I run a project which is very s similar to Fix Gatami and uh, there is a separate uh, electronic company for uh, dealing with the public lighting and I saw that they have an application and I wanted to know how much was this, who did it, who did it for them, who developed it and then I requested it fr uh, from them via Alavetelli because I wanted to you know, know what's inside the contract so I just asked for it and since it's public procurement I received the information so I, I know who that was, uh, what were the main specifications so if I wanted to be in the public procur poc procurement business this would be very useful for me. And then um, I think Atlatso has also introduced the how much was that attitude, you will see it later. Uh, but how much was that in briefly relates to the fact that, for example, Atlatso's bloggers, they are just reading the news every day and then they see something like, oh, this politician went there, this politician said this, they were referring to this publication or this research. Where is that research? Where is that publication? Or where are those numbers coming for, from? Or how much was the prime minister's trip to somewhere? We have a huge case now going on because of the minister for the prime minister's office. He doesn't want to release the, uh, the information about how much he spent on uh, trips a few, few years ago. Or it's uh, published already how much he released, but now it's not public who he traveled with or where he stayed at, and it's a lot of money, and, and uh, even a Hungarian uh, news site uh, has to, uh, was kind of like uh, broken in the whole scandal, meaning that their investigative journalist uh, had to leave and start his own project, similar to Atlatso's story. So how much was that attitude? Uh, there was a case in 2014 when uh, Hungary or Budapest has opened a new uh, football stadium. Our prime minister loves football. So we spend a lot of money on football and uh, this football club has had their new stadium so during the opening ceremony they were flying Gripen fighter jets over the ceremony area and then people were like wow how much was that <laughs> and then, and then uh, a freedom of information request was filed and the Ministry of Defense they said that this was part of a regular drill so it costs no money, or no extra money, I'm, I'm sorry. So, of course, people were kind of like shocked about all this, and, and the Ministry of Defense, they got emails like, can you fly the Gripens over my girlfriend's house because she has birthday next week? And since uh, the Ministry of Defense couldn't really say like, no, we are not flying things over where you request, they just said that the regular drill is not going to be in that area that time. So, yeah, this is how you kind of figure out about everyday stories, how the government is spending your money or how things work. Uh, we also had a huge uh, freedom of information case. Uh, Sirt Kafte is a company in a Budapest district. They were uh, connected to EU funding, uh, the use of EU funds. The whole story came out because there was a public uh, tender that was uh, published with the requirements that could be only fulfilled by one company, which is not really nice if it comes to competition for EU funds. So we kind of requested the information and we couldn't get it because the original company doesn't exist anymore. 
uh, of course. Uh, and there is another company which is related to that district's mayor, and we asked for all the all the invoices and contracts with this uh, company. And uh, first, they wanted to request 58,000 uh, Norwegian kroner for the information because they said they need the money for scanning the documents. And then uh, we fought against that in court because we said that this, uh, that's too much, it doesn't cost that money. So in the end, I think it was a year and a half in court and we only had to pay 7,000 uh, 7, kroners. So it's much more reasonable uh, in Hungarian standards. But, uh, and getting back to open data, we got printed and scanned and handwritten documents. So thank you <laughs> for your help, which is not very nice. And we had to use 40 volunteers uh, who were uh, just digitizing all the data with Google Form. Uh, it was 800 items altogether and 400 million Hungarian forints. This is just the rough data we had, so we digitized all these invo invoices. It was really cool. And then... Uh, uh, well, I don't know how much is that in Norwegian kroner. So the 58,000 was uh, in euros. Mm. You can sell it in British pounds, it's not <laughs> useful for anyone. <laughs> Maybe like 100,000? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... No, this was the amount that the company was working with uh, the, the district. So for the data, it was 58,000 kroners. And in the end, 7,000. Uh, there was another big freedom of information case and I'm, I'm l really listing these cases because I would like to inspire you to kind of dig into all the, uh, the details of how your government work and uh, how, how the government works and how do they spend your, your money because it's your money. Um, so there was this uh, case in 2010 13, when the government changed the tobacco law, which means that they have totally changed the tobacco market and they have introduced the concept of national tobacco shops and people or shops could only sell uh, any sort of uh, tobacco goods with the state issued license. And uh, we wanted to know uh, how they distributed these licenses because it completely changed the market. Uh, and we even filed a joint freedom of information request. I think I were like six uh, NGOs and media outlets filing the same request for the same data. And the government got really angry and they changed the freedom of information law. They issued an amendment in less than a week. So we even ran a petition because the president can still send the law back but uh, he didn't do anything about it and uh, they have introduced the concept of vexatious freedom of information requests sorry uh, vexatious not being a legal term of course so you cannot really tell what's vexatious the, the official description says that you cannot request sort of invoice level data which means that you cannot request all the invoices like we did in the previous uh, case uh, I think this data is already released now, but uh, I think uh, in the end, one of the political parties, they got it in printed format. So this is not over yet, but this was the first change of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, Martians is a television series in Hungary, which was produced by the public media Asset Management Fund, which is a similar concept to NRCO. So they are managing all the public media, radio, TV, whatever. And uh, we wanted to know how much uh, did they, the production of Martians uh, cost for Hungarian people. And in the end, it turned out that it was not a successful story, but they still kept on producing it. And in 2013, we filed a lawsuit for the data and we won the case, but they still wouldn't have 
uh, given us the information. Uh, at Lazo, in the end, obtained the information. But uh, in Hungary, you can uh, get, I think, up to two years for withholding uh, the, free, uh, the public information. So in this case, we already had uh, uh, the decision in court, and someone was still holding it back. So we filed criminal. Uh, we, we pushed criminal charges uh, against uh, the MTVA, which is the abbreviation for the Public Media Asset Management Fund. Uh, and the police, uh, they have recently uh, said that they are going to close the investigation because they can't find the responsible person, which is like very, very interesting in a public media asset management fund that you don't know who is responsible for uh, publishing the data. And uh, well, at Lazo's journalists could call the guy and tell him that you know, the police is looking for him. And, but in the end, the person who is actually on paper responsible for the handling over the data is also a very low key person in the whole story. So it's not the person who is gaining money on this uh, production at all. So uh, we had, I have been talking about this uh, vexatious uh, thing. Vexatious freedom of information request is also a, kind of like an expression in Hungary. We even have it on uh, Atlatso's t-shirts. So this is like the way, <laughs> way we go to drum and bass parties. Um, and uh, recently, the government again introduced an amendment to the law, which is, go uh, which is taking effect uh, in September. Uh, some of it is already in effect, and they have added new um, things to the law, which are allowing, for example, uh, to institutions to decide at the individ individual level about the human labor costs. So for example, the story I was telling you about the 58,000 thing, uh, in, that, in those cases, they might get away with telling you that it's 58,000. And even if you think it's not reasonable, reasonable, it would be very hard to fight in court because then you are trying to kind of like fight their reasoning of how much it costs for them to produce it for you. And uh, considering that many of these documents are just kept on paper, it's a, it's a tough, tough job. Uh, they removed uh, the possibility of sending anonymous requests. Before, even if you sent anonymous requests, like for example, with our website, it's okay, you can do it. And if, it, if they release the information, that's not a problem. But if you want to file a lawsuit, of course, then you have to give your name. And then, then the court is looking at the original request where you have to have your own name to identify yourself in court. Uh, the new amendment also allows uh, the institutions to refuse to answer based on decision making, uh, part of a decision making progress uh, argumentation, which means that uh, they can just say that we are just about to decide about something and, and we are not releasing the documents. Yeah? I get the feeling that uh, well, your law is getting more and more limited. Yeah. <laughs> I think they are tightening up because uh, I think it's a political issue. So the, the government is trying to strengthen their power. They have the second uh, term in two thirds majority. They have even changed the election law. So they have changed many things in the country in order to keep their uh, place. The, the original, sorry, the original uh, Freedom of Information Act was from EU regulation, right? From there? Or uh, what was the cause for introducing the Freedom of Information Act in the beginning? What was the cause for using it? Introducing it. Introducing it. Uh, as far as I know, we really had good lawyers and good constitutional court at the time. So they were very open and they wanted to introduce a good law. Yeah, I, I believe it uh, came from EU uh, uh, rules uh, somehow. Mm, but it might be that uh, policies were affected by EU as well. But at the time, we were not EU members yet. 
Is the government left wing, centre or right? Uh, right. Any more questions about the government? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, another case where we were trying to fight the invoice level of vexatious sort of uh, amendment of the law was uh, the campaign expenses from 2014. So, since the law was changed, uh, people got uh, sort of like a, support from the state to spend money on campaign expenses and these could be sort of like self-promotion so they could print posters, they could buy food, they could uh, buy gasoline to go to places and then talk to the voters. So if a candidate got a certain amount of signature then they could get this uh, money. And uh, we thought that this would be really good to take a look at because it's public money. So they were just given this uh, uh, money to spend on anything, basically. Uh, a lawyer told me that uh, because it was uh, handled all by the state treasury, the treasury mainly looked at the formal data, meaning that they wanted to know how much they used from the money they were given, so they didn't actually check all the invoices. And this is a part of uh, an invoice list. So what we in the end got is that each candidate had to uh, submit a list of invoices. So it starts with the invoice number, the date of uh, the issuing of the invoice, uh, the company that was selling the services and then what was it spent on and then wh when was it paid and then uh, some kind of like comment or reason for the spending and then the rest is like gross and net amount of money and uh, we requested this data and we got 556 files this was a very important case because of this invoice level thing so I think there were three anti-corruption NGOs in Hungary that were in law, in court at the same time fighting for this data and everybody won so we got this and we actually did a joint campaign we did a data sprint at Atlatso's birthday I'm just gonna show this so uh, this was the data sprint we stayed at the birthday party in a room and we kept uh, digitizing the data because as you can see this is handwritten of course and uh, if you really want to uh, make it transparent and useful and uh, you know let people search for data then of course it has to be digitized so 556 pages we couldn't uh, finish it we have built a separate website only for this uh, form that they were uh, submitting it's a it's a Django based uh, platform and um, there's a group of users who can enter the data and another group of users are checking the, the entered data. This data also has on the list uh, the invoices that were not accepted by the state treasury. So just to give you some interesting information, during the data sprint we found that uh, a far-right politician uh, submitted an invoice for, uh, of a belly dancer. And we found this because someone, because we, we give the users a randomized uh, candidate, so you don't know who you will get, but he got this far right, a uh, person got this far right uh, politician and he, he kept looking at the data, of course, like checking it more closely because it's a famous politician. And he saw that there was like a crossed off expense, what's this? And it was like a name and, and uh, invoice of a certain person and if you google this name then you saw belly dancing videos so i am guessing that the state treasury was also looking more closely at the famous politicians but we also found people who spend money on buying a pair of nike air max or new phones laptops which is like more close to using something for campaign expenses but that's also something that you're going to use after the campaign as well so it's kind of like it's for the voters to decide if it's a good way to use their uh, money or if it's not. So, and this was the youngest participant of the data sprint. And 
Yeah, you're right. That's the Norwegian flag there. Yes? Has any prosecutions come out from uh, this? Uh, Not yet. Expenses? Not yet, because uh, we still have to finish the digitizing part. And uh, the big plan is to do a, a Hacks Hackers event later during the fall, where we can uh, show uh, more about the data. Another interesting thing, and it's easy to show, that many people uh, filed one invoice uh, list, meaning that they took all the money as a consulting invoice, for example. Or, or you could already tell, even after uh, entering 200 and something uh, uh, invoice list uh, documents, that there's a certain company that was always working with far-right politicians, for example. So this is the data we will be looking at. Um, so yeah, I was saying that's the Norwegian flag there. This picture is from the last year's Atlatso birthday, because that was the time when the whole Norwegian scandal started in Hungary. So I thought it would be nice for you to know that <laughs> in Hungary, the, the NGOs can get uh, funding from the Norway NGO grant, which is part of the big uh, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, uh, big fund, development funds for uh, developing EU countries. And uh, the Hungarian government had some dispute with the Norwegian government on the, on the big generic uh, development funds, like who should be handling the funds and, and who should distribute them because the Hungarian government wanted to distribute it through their own institution and the Norwegian uh, party wanted to uh, have some independent institution that handles the, the money, which is like that when it comes to the NGO fund. So the NGO fund, you know, like they sponsor people like us. So for example, we got money for uh, holding workshops and teaching people how to use freedom of information requests. So we were showing them our website. Uh, the workshops consist of three parts. So first we talk about the legal aspects and then journalists talk about how to produce uh, stories about uh, the data you, uh, you get from the freedom of information request. And then we have a part where we file freedom of information requests on our Alavetelli website. And uh, government, uh, they didn't really like NGOs doing democracy stuff. Just to say the least. So they started an investigation against 58 NGOs that ever got uh, funding from the Norway NGO Fund. And they requested documents from them about projects that have been running for years or that were run uh, years ago. And uh, they didn't really do anything like big, except for really threatening people who work in the NGO sector because in Hungary it's like unheard of that, that the government is cracking down on people who do good stuff. I mean, I don't know about Norway, but I think for me it was quite surprising. And uh, I think the worst part was when they uh, had a police raid at one of the organizations that are uh, handing out the, the grants and they took their server, for example. So at the time we were like, really scared that if you are working on a Norway NGO project, then they could take away your computer. And so how about uh, security and privacy and encryption? And uh, this story has not stopped yet. It, it, it's just calmed down. So we don't really know what are the outcomes. They have published a short uh, uh, um, summary of what they found, but those were mainly like administrative problems with certain NGOs that they were looking at. So for example, Atlatso hasn't received any information yet about like if we were good or not, or if we were nice or, or not, I don't know. But uh, there was a list of, like there was a big blacklist uh, of 13 NGOs. So from the 58, there was like st still 13 that are like really bad. Of course, Atlatso is on that list, but uh, all of my colleagues say that if we weren't there, then you know we wouldn't be doing our job well or something. So it's cool, I guess. So uh, yeah, this is a picture from our workshop. So uh, we are still trying to do this, and you know don't care about uh, 
what's happening because initially launching an investigative journalism site is like not a big deal that the government is not happy about what you do. So in the first phase, like we really didn't care about this uh, Norway NGO investigation because yeah, no one likes that Lato in the government. So whatever. Um, yeah, so we did these, these workshops and we keep on doing them and uh, we are also launching workshops for uh, high school students. So people who are turning just about 18, they should be uh, citizens who know this right and uh, we are teaching them how to become educated citizens and make educated decisions about uh, Hungary and Hungary's issues. And uh, I thought if you would like to read more about our work or read our articles, then this is the link for that. And um, yeah, thank you for the invitation and read at Lazzo. I don't know, prosecution that's happened or the highest profile prosecution that's happened because of a freedom of information uh, request that started because of that and then it's been handed to prosecution, prosecutors and they've prosecuted it to the, to the end. I think there's no such a case. So no one is in prison because of uh, things that were discovered and, and... Is that because the prosecutors aren't prosecuting or is that because the a judgment is made for uh, whoever for the defense so to speak mm -hmm. I think it's because uh, because of the prosecutors uh, are not doing their job because in in general the jurisdiction is it's quite independent so for example in the freedom of information cases we keep winning these cases and the judges they know that it's important to publish these informations like the ones about the MP expenses or candidate expenses this is something they people have to know about and we had to argue in court that uh, the invoice level in this case it stands that people have they need to see that you are buying an Nike Air Max from public money but uh, I think the prosecutor's office is a, it's a different thing Voted for? Uh, are, prosecutors are prosecutors voted for or are they appointed? Uh, I think they are appointed and they are voted for in a, s a certain uh, committee in parliament. So it's part of the government, uh, whether it's local government or yeah, central government, sort of. appoints uh, yeah. prosecutors? Yeah. Okay. It seems that you're uh, quite happy with the judicial system in uh, Hungary, but... Uh, uh, yeah, we keep on going to court. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, if I don't remember incorrectly, wasn't there some kind of scandal about appointment of uh, high judges or something? Yeah, there was, because it was the same way as uh, we were talking about the prosecutor's office, but uh, this still doesn't mean that the judges at the regular level would decide against uh, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, in this case, when the last amendment was introduced, uh, there was a huge debate about how we should fight it, because uh, many people think that we should fight like, right away and create a huge scandal around uh, the amendment of the law again in a couple of years, and it's, it's uh, serious limitations to how t you can exercise the law. But uh, for example, in Hungary it works uh, the way that the last place you can go, go is the constitutional court. So first you have to file a request and it has to be refused and you go, go to court and there are two rounds. So you, you appeal and if uh, they decide against you everywhere, you can still go to the constitutional court. And if there is a constitutional court decision, then the judges would refer to that 
So if we are fighting like now without having a case like those when we were kind of like directly filing requests for invoice level kind of stuff, then uh, maybe the constitutional court wouldn't uh, decide in our sort of favor and then they would use that decision against us in the new cases. Just to follow up on the uh, mm -hmm. beginning, uh, you don't think those appointments will uh, affect the freedom of information uh, request you you are doing? The, d double the, the appointments of the Supreme Court judges? I think they still um, don't affect, I mean, yeah, there are cases when you just can't get the information. Like, for example, in the case of the agreement with the Russia about the expansion of uh, our nuclear plant, which is based on a loan from coming from Russia. And, uh, you know, many people, even journalists or NGOs, have filed freedom of information requests for the contract, the agreement documentation, the, the feasibility study, and they wouldn't release anything. So, yeah, because they decided to uh, make it a secret for uh, at least, I think, 10 years. So in, in cases like that, I think, yeah, they would do, they would do it. I think it's, it's sort of a, a bid. Maybe you are not finding a case when where someone like high level or high ranking person is interested or, or big money is there, or I don't know. So I don't, I can't really tell like what's the level of uh, an issue where they would use these things that they would just say, oh, this state secret for 10 years, that's it. I, I can't really tell. This, this was, yeah, you can tell that the nuclear expansion, uh, plant expansion is something they would be secretive about. Um, yeah, there, you see that uh, in Norway there has been uh, lim limitations to uh, freedom of information laws now. Uh, and uh, it started a process to change the laws, both in UK and it's also started the process in Norway to change the laws, mm -hmm. which I don't think would be positive. But uh, except for the invoice limitation, like the invoice level, lim do, do you have any other uh, changes to the law coming up in Hungary that might affect uh, Alavatelli or running a site like? I think this, because the latest amendment was just a few months ago, so <laughs> I can't really tell what's, what's coming or what's next. Um, I don't know if I think they would introduce some not digital limitations like the not being able to send emails thing, or many say that the letting the institutions decide about human labor costs is also something that for example, would scare away requesters. Also because uh, the media kept publishing that now freedom of information requests will not be free. So people only hear these things, small bits of information, and it's already a sort of like government, uh, let's say propaganda, that you create a debate or a tension and, and uh, people who are not working in this field and they would just only read the headlines which say, you have to pay for freedom of information requests from now on, and it's not true. You, you all had to pay before, too, because we had to pay for scanning or, or something that's, that was in the law before. You could, uh, but you could fight if it was uh, not reasonable. So like in the 58,000 versus uh, 7,000 kroner case, you could fight and you could argue that this is not reasonable. Um, I, I feel quite impressed by uh, when you were talking about this. Uh, it seems like you have quite a lot of uh, uh, democratic NGOs in uh, in Hungary, or that uh, they are, um, you know, able to to do a lot of things. So I'm I'm wondering uh, both uh, what uh, your uh, newspaper and organization and and the other ones how how do they you know. How did they came to be important there? And, and uh, I don't know how much you know about the Norwegian situation, but uh, if you do, then uh, could you see something uh, similar happening more in uh, Norway as well? Like the limitations, or um, yeah, how how uh, you start 
earning, uh, you know, you, when you have an organization like this, you would need some funds to actually mm -hmm. run it. And that's one thing. And the other thing is that you also would need to uh, have the public's uh, eyes in some cases, because if you find out lots of things, but no one reads it or sees it, then it doesn't really matter that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in our case, um, it was good because there was no no one on the market, let's say, at the time, who, who were advertising themselves as an independent website for journalism. And we were the first ones who were an NGO started by journalists, totally independent. And uh, we have become popular, known as Atlatso, the independent investigative journalism site. And as you are saying, like the public keeps looking at NGOs also because the government tells them to do it. <laughs> Maybe not to look at government stuff, I don't know. But we are trying to be like especially transparent about what we do and where we get funding from. Like, you know, it's kind of like almost a psychological effect that I even start uh, my presentation here talking to you about where our funding crumbs, comes from. So I mentioned the grants and I also mentioned the micro donations. I think it's important uh, also for other NGOs to know that they can actually gather enough money from micro donations, but they have to work really hard. It's uh, very similar to running a startup. So like we, we keep promoting ourselves and our sort of products on our own website too. So for example, whenever there's a freedom of information request, we always link to the Alavetelli site. We always tell people to use it or we even publish like how to file a good freedom of information request uh, sort of blog post because uh, we think it's important, but it's also a sort of self-promotion and you don't feel like really, I don't know, offended in the same way as in a commercial project because it's it's for a democratic issue uh, I want to uh, ask if you heard about uh, something related to the uh, I took a bribe website I heard uh, I think a year or two ago about an Indian project where they had zero do dollar bills and the they looked kind of like money and had some information about the website where corruption was reported and it was basically something you would pay someone asking for a bribe. So they would get a zero dollar bill and if you don't accept it, I will report you kind of message. Uh -huh. And uh, it was <clears throat> apparently quite effective to get people to shape up a bit because um, <clears throat> they've been called on the bribing and they knew it would uh, might I'm get some consequence if they if they didn't accept it. I don't know, I think this leads like too far. Like there, there are many initiatives where you are, you can think of creative ways of catching people uh, when they are doing bad things. And uh, our I Pray the Bribe was launched with the thought of just showing how much we pay every day as bribes. Also like I even saw yesterday a Facebook post of a friend of mine because he's uh, doing uh, his driving license for a motorcycle and then he was actually told to pay a bribe because in Hungary I think that you can fail five times at the exam or something like that so if you fail like three times you are kind of like that's implied that you know if you don't want to fail five times then you should pay some money and then he was posting this on Facebook that that uh, the instructor is kind of implying that he should pay a bribe if he wants to get his license and also because if you are not if you are failing then you have to take extra driving hours so it costs much more money so people often decide uh, that they should pay a bribe, but I don't think it's a good thing, and that's why we released the website, because we wanted to show people that this is happening to everyone every day, and uh, we should stop it. Um, referring to this example you gave, are, are people allowed to record a conversation without both parties knowing? No. Okay. Um, but it, I mean, as a journalist, I can say it often happens. Okay. And uh, separate to that, on average, you must have worked out the cost, uh, the average cost per year that it costs for corruption. 
have have you what would that figure be roughly uh, uh, i don't know i can check wage, the transparency uh, international's uh, corruption report about this but i don't know the figure okay thank you and actually there's another hungarian person in the room you can ask there's moni who is also a journalist so if, if there will be some mingling around, then you can talk to her as well. But if there are no more questions, I think we should say um, <coughs> great thank you to uh, Marietta. Thanks for the invitation. And, yeah. and good luck with BMS Brun. Yeah.